For whatever godforsaken reason, I am about to talk about Pokemon again for the next however many minutes. Why do I do this to myself? I can only tell you that it's probably something to do with what I said at the end of my Pokemon Sword and Shield video last November, in which I said that the Pokemon franchise has had a tight grip on my genitalia for years now. Despite the fact that the franchise, in my opinion, continues to repeatedly squander its potential, I fear that said grip has now moved down to my great balls, which are currently swelling to the size and shape shape of a pair of spheal as I record audio for this video. If anyone has a pair of pliers they can send me, it would be greatly appreciated. So in this video, I'm pretty much going to be looking into where I think the series has so much potential and where I think for the past decade it's generally failed to fulfil that potential. And in the interest of fairness, I think it's important to say that while I consider myself to be reasonably well informed when it comes to game design, I'm certainly not 52-year-old industry veteran Junichi Masada, who we will be talking about quite a lot later in this video. Basically, I'm really trying to avoid getting any more hate mail. That sounds like a joke, but uh, anyone who follows me on Twitter, link in description, will know that I received an actual hate email just the other week about my Pokemon Sun and Moon video, which is not only the oldest video on my channel, but it's also the one I'm most right about. I mean, if you're going to email me hate about something, do it about the black and white video. Jesus, get some standards. Anyway, I, I just think this seems like the right time to make this kind of video. It seems like a good Good time for me to kind of collate all the things I've said about Pokemon game design over the course of the videos I've done about the past four generations and make it clear how I think the series is going in the wrong direction as opposed to other Nintendo series like say Zelda which I think changed up its main formula in just the right way at just the right time. It's all one guy's opinion, I'm not an expert, don't be a dick. So I suppose you could say that it's time to look into things. Uh, too much. So yeah, in case it's not clear from the introduction or title or thumbnail of this video or any of the various things that I've said about the past four generations of Pokemon in my previous videos, the Pokemon franchise, in my opinion, is the single biggest waste of potential since I started a YouTube channel. I should be writing Doctor Who by now, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. So one of the things that I have most frequently maligned about the past few generations of Pokemon is the difficulty, and I am going to wax lyrical for a portion of this video about the beauty of difficulty in any video game and how it breeds new experiences. Experiences. Uh, before I do, not to beat you over the head with self-promotion and tell you that you absolutely need to see my quadrilogy of videos on the past four generations of Pokemon to understand this video, you definitely don't, but they will help kind of frame and contextualise a lot of the things I'm going to say today because a lot of this video is building off the sentiments I've shared in those videos. I won't spend too much time on the Generation 6 onwards experience share, even if you haven't seen my prior videos, I feel like we can probably come to an agreement that it's really overtuned and is making the recent games a completely trivial affair. While I think that Sword and Shield, as opposed to X and Y and Sun and Moon, were balanced much better around the party-wide experience share, at least comparatively, I think not even giving you the option to turn it off is just ridiculous. I think a lot of elements of Pokemon's design, especially in recent years, are a very telling microcosm of Nintendo's design philosophy as a whole. So often, they go to great lengths to make games as accessible as possible and then incentivize if not outright force you to play the way that they want you to play. You want to time travel in Animal Crossing? Okay, we'll spoil your turnips. Want to try and play Smash competitively? They've eased up on it a bit since, but back in the 2000s they went to every length to stop you from doing so. Shoutouts to tripping, shoutouts to trying to cancel EVO 2013's melee tournament. Yes, the new experience share gives all your team members experience and as a result basically removes grinding from the game. However, it also also robs you of practically any unique or memorable experiences. Let me explain what I mean. Think back to some of your favourite moments and experiences in video games ever. Ones that weren't intended by the game or part of the main story or whatever. Memorable experiences you had on your own. So for example, my friends and I used to play hardcore Minecraft, right? We'd set ourselves a goal with a party of seven or eight and when one of us died, we treated it as permadeath. We had to leave the voice call and we were no longer a part of the game for the rest of 
that campaign. Because of the constant drama and tension throughout these sessions, we all have some amazing stories from Hardcore Minecraft. I'm constantly reminiscing with my friends about how one of my friends and I staked out in the desert biome for a few in-game weeks on end hunting endermen. We built a huge watchtower in a desert village and every night we went to the top to look out across the world and see if we could spot any. And when we did, the hunt was on. One night, seemingly out of nowhere, a zombie siege struck the village that we were temporarily living in and we had to deal with it between just the two of us. There must have been like 30 zombies, there were only 4 or 5 of us left in the whole game at this rate, any death could have been huge, miraculously we survived and dealt with the whole invasion by ourselves but it brought us close to dying on numerous occasions, we spent a whole in-game night fighting off these zombies and I remember watching the sun rise as the dust settled, the, uh, <laughs> the Minecraft sun. <laughs> Sorry, I've just, I've just realised how ridiculous that sounds. The Minecraft sun as the Minecraft dust settled in the Minecraft world. I remember just watching the sunrise and thinking, wow, what a moment. You know, what, what an experience. I've been given a story that I'll remember and laugh about with my friends for ages. Hardcore Minecraft gave me and my friends so many stories like this. At first, this might seem like a weird example, right? I'm not saying that Pokemon needs constant drama and tension and that it needs to be anywhere near as nail-biting as Hardcore Minecraft is. I want to make it clear that this is not a video about what Pokemon should be. This is about what I think Pokemon could be. I'm just using this Minecraft example to convey the beauty of difficulty and challenge in video games and by extension the beauty of spontaneity in video games. Two things that Pokemon has lacked for what feels like forever. Surprising, unfixed events provide players with memorable moments and stories that will stay with them and are unique to them. I made a video about this exact topic and why I think it's so special, you should go check it out. Pokemon, whether intentionally or not, has actually had a moment like this. A near mythical challenge that, for better or for worse, gave a whole generation of hashtag gamers war stories about an arduous battle with a seemingly immovable object, a truly imposing obstacle that they were forced to overcome. It's this fat cow. Was the surprising difficulty of Whitney's mill tank a good thing? I don't know. I have no doubt that the random, unpredictable difficulty spike that it represents was a huge turning off point for a lot of players. This battle is infamously hard for the casual player and possibly ended the journeys of a lot of potential future fans. But allow me to play devil's advocate for a moment. What this battle also does through its difficulty is create stories and give players unique experiences experiences. This is not a battle that you can just shove your starter into and spam whatever attacking moves you have. On a normal playthrough, Whitney's mill tank generally requires some kind of strategy. The most effective tactic is probably to catch a drowsy and trade it for a machop in Goldenrod City, but even then this mill tank is such a threat that that's not even a guarantee of victory. The odd person might get lucky and just steamroll through this fight or just so happen to have the perfect strategy already planned out, but for the average player who had to adapt, Whitney's mill tank is memorable. I talked about this concept a lot in my Pokemon Sun and Moon video ages ago, but challenge in Pokemon games, moments where a single team member comes through for you or a strategy pays off is what gets you invested in the gameplay of Pokemon. Moments of tension and challenge like this get you attached to that one specific member of your team who clutched out the battle. This is how Pokemon games give you stories beyond their main plot. I don't think Whitney's Mill Tank is a particularly elegant example of appropriate challenge I do kind of love that the game never directly builds it up like it's any more threatening than any other gym leader's Pokemon and that it doesn't really seem like the designers ever anticipated that this Pokemon would be the one to give players so much trouble because it kind of adds to that somewhat mythical quality about it. But obviously it's never good to have such a random and unpredictable difficulty spike. I'm just saying that at least it's memorable. I'm not saying I'd like to see these kinds of fights all the time in Pokemon games but I'd certainly like to see more of them because everyone's going to come out of it having a different experience experience in, in how they got through it, they're going to have a different story. Almost. Almost everyone. A lot of people. This thing about difficulty breeding experience, forcing players to adapt and develop stories and get attached to their Pokemon, it doesn't work both ways. How many memorable battles have you had in the past three generations of Pokemon? Maybe Totem Lorantis? Maybe Leon from Sword and Shield? I don't know. A couple maybes across three whole generations of main series Pokemon games says a lot I think. There's a reason 
but people still talk about Whitney's mill tank to this day and almost no one has any stories or really anything to say at all about the gameplay and battles of the past three generations. Having an experience share that levels up your entire party makes it so that hypothetically you can just use one or two Pokemon through a whole playthrough. You're given very little reason to use certain Pokemon outside of type advantages. When my brother and I were kids playing Pokemon Gold and Silver respectively on our Game Boy Colors in our garden, he used to just use Typhlosion the whole way through and no one else. The experience share wasn't completely game breaking back then, but he used to just over level his starter like crazy and steamroll everything with it. I hated that. Far be it from me to become Nintendo and try and stop people from playing their own way, but I've just always thought that the core appeal of Pokemon was constructing a party, a team that you cared about and get attached to. As Game Freak dumbs the games down more and more over time, that becomes harder to do. It's not just the experience share that's made the game's core gameplay of battling so easy that it's completely mindless, but it's the random busted gift Pokemon just given to you for free, like the Mega Kanto starter and the Mega Lucario in X and Y, the Mega Latias or Latios in Auras, the silly single generation battle gimmicks that Game Freak keep putting into the games seemingly to substitute any actual substantial changes to the otherwise stale formula. The affection gimmicks that we've seen come into play in the past three generations, as well as apparently Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, I didn't play those games, I wish Game Freak would just get the fuck over Kanto. On paper, I like these a lot, they seem implemented specifically to help you get more attached to your Pokemon, which is good, but they're another great example of wasted potential because they're so shallow and not fleshed out at all. More often than not, it's just you doing the same one or two things over and over again. Rob the touch screen, throw a ball, you know, and then suddenly your Pokemon are doing completely busted things like living moves at 1 HP and, and one-shotting people and getting critical hits just because you, you tap the touch screen a few times throughout the game. I think stories and moments and attachment comes from when your back is genuinely against the wall, not when one of the Pokemon in your party might faint because you couldn't be bothered to heal, but then they decide to just not faint and one-shot your enemy. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that makes you go, cool, and then just move on and forget about it. By now, I'm sure that some of the most cynical of you are practically screaming at your screen, it's a kid's game, it's a kid's game, why are you being so stupid about this? To which I would say firstly, again, not what Pokemon should be, what Pokemon could be, but secretly what I think it should be. But also, I'm not exactly an expert on kids, in fact I hate all of them, but just because kids are kids and they're young, that doesn't mean that they're stupid and they're incapable of thinking for themselves. I like to think that a lot of kids would appreciate not being pandered to and treated with respect for their intelligence and problem solving abilities. I'm sure they'd much rather that than being pushed along a linear path on rails by NPCs who won't shut up so that they can experience an extremely mediocre and uninteresting story, whilst they also go on to experience no actual gameplay stories of their own. It's very clear that the handholdy, mindless and needlessly linear nature of the past three generations of Pokemon are no accident. They are a direct result of Game Freak's design philosophy towards Pokemon. I've had nice things to say about generations 6 and 8, but that doesn't mean that they don't have the same obnoxious problems as Sun and Moon, and that the three together aren't emblematic of the, in my opinion, quite saddening direction the franchise has been heading in the past decade. Look, I can't speak for every child today, but I can speak from experience about when I was a child. See, I was not a regular kid. As I've talked about before in previous videos, I am autistic. And as an autistic child, there were a lot of things that I just didn't get. There are a lot of things that would naturally occur to other people that just simply didn't make sense to me. Pokemon made sense to me. Okay, I mean, the PC system didn't immediately make sense to me. It took me a while to figure it out, and I, I spent the first few hours of my first ever playthrough in Pokemon Gold with like three Spearow in my party that I didn't know what to do with, but I figured it out eventually by myself. Nothing was too hard for me to understand, and as silly as it may sound, when I got to grips with the PC system, it felt good. It made me feel smart for discovering something by myself. This logic extends to all factors of these games. If you just let people figure things out for themselves, it's so much more satisfying and so much more conducive to unique experiences than being beat over the head with constant handholding and tutorials. I'm not saying be completely obtuse and don't tell the players anything, I'm saying it's a matter of moderation and not insulting your players' intelligence, even if they're kids. Were the first four or five generations of Pokemon particularly inaccessible? Were they so hard in their difficulty or complicated to get to grips with that it turned players off? I feel like surely almost everyone will say no to that, right? <laughs> Most people will say that as far as kids' games go, they had a near-perfect balance of holding your hand just in 
enough and telling you just enough about how to play the game whilst also respecting the player's intelligence and giving them freedom, that's really important. Letting them go off and do their own thing and maybe even make their own mistakes. Hell, I would argue that they could have lent even more into that. I think Pokemon games, despite being kids games, could actually have afforded to be a bit more obtuse. To maybe tell the players even less about the core mechanics and maybe let them accidentally stumble into Pokemon with way higher levels than them early on or at various points throughout the game. The thing is that based on the past three generations of Pokemon, Junichi Masada and the design team over at Game Freak seem to disagree. Junichi Masada has been with Game Freak since its inception, working on Pokemon for a large majority of his career. From what I can find online, his days spent working on the first two generations mainly revolved around composing music and doing minor bits of programming. He took on far more responsibilities as designer and producer on Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, hey pretty great games, and has basically been seen as the head honcho of Pokemon ever since. Masuda's design philosophy is that he wants to make Pokemon as accessible as possible, he wants it to appeal to everyone of all ages. It's not a bad goal at all, but in a lot of the things he says and a lot of the things that are evident through the design decisions made in the recent games, I mean, I'm not saying he's wrong, I'm, I'm saying I think he's wrong. <laughs> I'm saying I disagree with his outlook. There's an article on GameSpot called Pokemon Director Explains Why Series Is Becoming Easier and it's an interview with Masada and in it he says, Rather than any actual feedback from players, it's more about accepting the realities of modern life. Kids these days or even people who grew up playing Pokemon, everyone is a lot more busy. There are a lot more things competing for a person's time than there were back then. For example, there are so many free games you can play on your phone now, there's so many entertainment options, so making it a little easier to play is the reason for that. He's obviously not inherently wrong that there are more things than ever competing for people's attention, I won't even touch the rather than any actual feedback from players bit because geez, but I question the conscious choice to make the games easier in response to there being more things than ever competing for people's attention. Is he aware that as they become easier they've become significantly more shallow and uninteresting for a large portion of players? Like personally, and I feel like a lot of players will probably probably feel the same on this, I'm far more likely to get distracted and go do something other than playing Pokemon because I'm sick of being railroaded into cutscenes with tiresome, uninteresting characters than I am when I'm given some freedom to have my own experiences. When he says he wants to make the games easier, is he conflating that with linear? Because I just don't think that approach has made Pokemon better at competing for people's time at all, I think it's done the opposite. I'm far more likely to get sucked into Pokemon when you give me a world and you let me do my own thing. Not only this, but this super super linear approach to Pokemon games has only made them less replayable than ever before. These are games in which you can build a different team every time around, the possibility of variance between playthroughs should be huge. And yet, in the past few generations, it's really not, in fact it feels like that's the only thing that changes between playthroughs. Whereas, as I brought up in my Sword and Shield video, previous Pokemon games have done non-linearity very well. You can tackle the gyms and certain parts of the world in different order. Nothing huge, again, and not to the extent I actually think Pokemon is capable of and should have led into more, but for example, I talked about Generation 2's non-linearity and how the world opens up to you when you get to Ecritique, and all the stuff you can do in different order with Price and Jasmine and Chuck. And yes, people brought up in the comment section of that video that Gen 2's specific example of non-linearity is quite bad because it messes up the level cap of a lot of the Pokemon. Because you can reasonably go to all these different places, all the Pokemon everywhere are like super low level, and that's a fair point. Maybe Gen 2 is is not a specifically great example because of the level thing. Although I think they could have just kept the levels high around Mahogany Town, it could have just been higher level Pokemon and you can just bump into them anyway. Maybe you faint, maybe you white out, that's not a big deal. Generation 3 and Generation 4 are probably better examples. I talked about Generation 3 with Slateport City and Jufford Town. You could do that stuff in different order. Generation 4, all the stuff with Hearthome City and Veilstone City and Pastoria City, you can do all that stuff in your own order. The playthroughs change, you know what I mean? Like, generation Generations 1 through 4 are significantly more replayable and as a result I would say compete for your time way more effectively. I've replayed the first 4 generations of Pokemon a lot and I've replayed the last 3 generations a lot less because I know that every time I do it's just going to be the same thing. The only thing I have control over is my party. And I'll ask again, based on the first 4 generations, is the linearity that's forced on you in these past few games necessary? Is it really because the games view their own stories as so important that they don't 
want you to miss anything. Like, that's okay for The Last of Us, right? News flash, Pokemon is not The Last of Us. Your story is not good or interesting enough to warrant railroading me like this. I complained about how in Sword and Shield, you move on from Hammerlock to Stow on Side, and there's nothing important going on in the plot. Well, I don't know why the world couldn't just open up to you a little bit there. Maybe you could go ahead past Stow on Side to Glimmer Tangle and Battle Leah, because you can already go to the wild area and accidentally bump into level 60 Tyranitars. Why is the game so scared of letting me go like one or two routes ahead and accidentally bumping into a scary Pokemon that's five levels higher than my current party, you know? It just seems totally unnecessary and I don't know why the past few games are so obsessed with boxing you in. There's this Game Informer interview with Junichi Masada and Shigeru Omori from 2017 about player freedom versus story in Pokemon games. And again, whenever Masada speaks, you can you can feel this perspective of we want to make Pokemon accessible or we want we want everyone to be able to like it. And I just I mean, if you look at his Wikipedia page, you can see a section about how his design philosophy is that he wants to make his games accessible and and for everyone to be able to play them. And I know that as a hashtag elite gamer, I'm coming at this from a biased perspective when I talk about difficulty because I play a lot of hard games and I like difficulty, but I don't like it to show off my big gamer balls. I like it because like I say it creates unique experiences not to speak for kids but whatever's going on with the past three generations of Pokemon I just I don't think making it more linear and easier and more dumbed down automatically makes it more appealing to kids it certainly makes it less appealing to people my age who grew up with the first four generations of Pokemon which as far as I can see there was nothing really wrong with as far as accessibility is concerned I'm open to being wrong here but I truly believe that this is not what kids want I think kids want an adventure and not a guided tour or some story that's told to them. I think they want to make their own stories. Not only do I think that Pokemon was fine for kids and older fans as it was, but I also think it could be doing so many more things with the two big pillars of its core gameplay, that being battling and exploration, and still maintaining that universal appeal. The world, for example, as well realised as they may seem on paper for the past three generations have basically been big hallways, and in Generation 8 you saw it all in the main story. Story. There were no extra caves or roots or anything else to explore. And I guess something else that I can't believe I didn't mention in my Sword and Shield video. Yeah, the route design is atrocious. Again, they're just big corridors. There's not even diverging paths on the routes themselves, man. Contrast this with Pacific Log Town in Ruby and Sapphire. You never have to go there. It's a place you can discover on your own. It's a reward for your exploration. There are so many more places like this in the first four generations. But the thing is that concepts like this sense of exploration and and discovery tied in with non-linearity I think can be taken so much further. I think Pokemon absolutely could and perhaps already should have done more branching paths, more potential sequence breaking if you even want to call it that and more discovery. Hell, I mean go full Breath of the Wild, right? Drop a player in a big open world at the start of the game, tell them very little and let them do their thing. Do they go east and run into a crazy powerful Pokemon that they're not ready for yet? Great! Story. They go west and have a crazy random encounter with a super rare Pokemon or maybe an unfixed event that's bound to happen but can happen at any time. Great. Story. If almost any other game series was seeing this many changes in the name of supposed accessibility, I probably wouldn't say a thing about it, but it's the fact that it's Pokemon, a franchise which supposedly holds getting attached to your Pokemon partners as a core concept. If that's what you want, then let my story be about them, not whatever group of generic child protagonists are gonna pull me along a narrow story path and spew dialogue at me. Not to mention that I feel and I think everyone else feels that it's already been doing accessibility fine. I just don't get what was supposedly wrong with the first four or so generations. I'm sure you don't need me to explain why an open world is such a natural fit for Pokemon. The potential is clearly there. Hell, the opportunity's been there for ages but Game Freak haven't taken it. If they just don't want to for whatever reason then that's fine but they can at least let you off your leash just a little bit more. Not just just in the past three generations, but in general. Aside from exploration, the other pillar of Pokemon's core gameplay is battling, and that is something that, again, has endless potential that you could tap into without alienating kids. I think the gym system has to go. Okay, never- oh god, bring it back. At least, I think gyms based on type have to go, because the strategy to beating a gym more often than not is use a Pokemon that's super effective against them. If you don't have one, catch one. Not only is that boring and mindless and contributes almost nothing to a player's unique experience, but I'm so tired of beating a water gym leader and having them tell me, brilliant, marvellous, your battle style is like nothing I've ever seen before, I'm inspired beyond belief, and it's like, 
bro, I, I just clicked Giga Drain three times in a row. If you insist on having this gym system be in every game, you could still just theme the gyms and gym leaders around other things that would make battles far more interesting. Maybe there's a gym leader who's obsessed with having no weaknesses. He has Electros and a bunch of Pokemon that only have one weakness, you know, Sableye, Spiritomb, Quagsire. Maybe there's one who doesn't want you to hit him with status effects, so he has a Gligar or a Gliscor with Poison Heal that holds a Toxic Orb, uh, a Guts Pokemon that holds a Flame Orb, an Umbreon with Synchronize. Maybe there's a gym leader who has a team built around Pokemon that people secretly want to bang. Lopunny, Gardevoir, Bronzong, just me? Okay, Sword and Shield actually came very close to having a battle like this, one with actual strategy. The Raihan battle, Raihan, Raihan, whatever. Actually a pretty cool fight, but there is absolutely nowhere near enough of this in any of the games. I would want it to be the standard. Would this make the games a lot harder on balance? Absolutely. Would a sensible step up in difficulty automatically turn off younger people from playing because kids are stupid and can't handle a challenge? No. Especially not if you add in extra accessibility options, like giving them a powerful rental Pokemon to use if they faint against the same opponent too many times. Maybe a hard and easy mode as well. If you want everyone to enjoy the game, then how about giving them actual options? For all of this talk about wanting to make the games enjoyable for everyone, I don't really see where the concessions have been made for the more long-time fans and the fans who have grown older, such as myself, who want a bit more of a challenge. Because people can sit there and just say that Pokemon is supposed to be a kid's game all they want, but Junichi Masada and Game Freak time and time again are telling you that it's for everyone. But I don't see that. All I see are his idea of what kid's games are supposed to look like. Where are the options? Finally, let's talk about that formula. Pokemon in concept is amazing. It's conceptually one of the best franchises of any kind in the world right now. And yet, for eight generations straight, it's done exactly the same thing. And this again is where we see Junichi Mad's affinity for child accessibility come into play, because what I've come to realise over time is that Pokemon is not just a franchise about a world of friendly, lovable creatures who you can form bonds with, it's a franchise about young kids having adventures. Which might sound quite romantic on paper, but I don't think it's a good thing. Or more specifically, I don't think it's an interesting thing. There's a lot of stories out there about kids having adventures, but most of them don't have Chatot in. He has a music note for a head. That's sick. Back in the days of like Generation 4 and Generation 5, I had a friend who used to tell me that he didn't want to play Pokemon games because they were all the same, and at the time I found that kind of laughable. But now that we're in Generation 8, I mean just saying that out loud to yourself sounds a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? Generation 8. I can't help but totally agree with him. Like it's it's shocking how many things each game shares in common and how many things they do the same. You're always a young kid from a small town who meets a professor named after a tree and then picks one of three starter Pokemon which are either water, fire or grass. There's always an evil team which is a really stupid thing in my opinion. Imagine the kinds of antagonists that Pokemon games could have that they just don't because they're fixated on having an evil team for some reason. This world is supposedly so big and vast and fascinating and we've seen and explored so little of it. Going even further, your starter Pokemon always evolve twice, once at level 16 or 18 and then again in their early mid 30s. There's always a regional bird, an original rodent or whatever. What about exploring this supposedly vast and fascinating world from a different perspective? Just this once, not being a young kid whose adventure is going to culminate with them fighting the Elite Four and a champion, or an equivalent fight. There's just so many more things that we could be doing with this supposedly fascinating world and this is where I think the Pokemon spin-offs are so much more interesting and so much cooler than the main series, right? Like Colosseum, you supposedly play as a criminal. I mean, granted, you don't really do anything criminal throughout the game. You're like totally a good guy, but supposedly a criminal and you just start off with an Espeon and an Umbreon and that's pretty cool and pretty interesting. And then XD, like you have an Eevee. Choices, right? What do you do with the Eevee? The mystery dungeon games, right? Actual good storytelling in Pokemon games. Isn't that a crazy concept? I've always found the Colosseum and XD games to be really weird because it feels like the developers finally had all the resources on hand to make that big fully 3D home console main series Pokemon game that people have been wanting for so long and they just kind of didn't. You know like the, the tagline for the series is gotta catch them all but with the shadow Pokemon mechanic it's like gotta catch some of them you can't catch the others though <laughs> which is it's really weird to me but I still really like them because like I say they explore this world from a different perspective. Then you look at games like Temtem that seem to be taking the concept of Pokemon and doing the same thing. Look no disrespect to the developers of Temtem, I'm sure it's a great game, but from what I've seen, there's so many things that are just the same as main series Pokemon, and I just think, man, you've got this concept in your hands, man, like, you could do something cool and interesting. It's just frustrating. As I say, Pokemon is such a clear example of 
wasted potential at almost every angle. There's so many things this franchise could be doing that it just isn't. It is by far Nintendo's most stale and unambitious franchise. In other interviews I've read with Masada that have taken place since the one I quoted earlier, he's gone on record saying that he thinks taking player feedback is really important, so I'm kind of left confused as to where he stands on player feedback. All I can say is that there's a lot of talk about making the games appeal to everyone, but there haven't been any difficulty options for 10 years, much less options in so many other ways you play the game. Nintendo's penchant for withholding options in the way that people play, or allowing their series to stagnate without really doing anything new or ambitious with their IPs, is probably why you see more fan games and ROM hacks of their games than any other game company in the world. Dreano Pokemon ROM hacks, Project M and P Plus, hell, Stardew Valley is partially born from Eric Baroni being dissatisfied with the state of the Harvest Moon franchise. Nintendo make games with blatantly massive potential, potential that is rarely ever met and fans are tired of sitting around and waiting for them to do so, so they try and take it into their own hands, until they get hit with a C&D, which to be fair isn't particularly unjustified because they're often just using official Nintendo assets and properties, but it's like, there is a reason this keeps happening. And frankly, whether I play them in the future or not, I think this would be the last time I talk about main series Pokemon games. No promises, maybe something big will change. I'd like to maybe talk about the spin-offs one day because I think they're pretty interesting and pretty cool by comparison, but if the next main series game comes along and does the exact same thing again, then the best thing I'll be able to muster is a giant sigh, maybe in video form, maybe. I wish things would change for a series that I grew up on and that I have so many precious memories with, but frankly, I very much doubt they will. So, as I pointed out in a community post not long ago, uh, we recently passed 10,000 subscribers, which is awesome, it's been pretty crazy to me, and I've been thinking about how I can celebrate that, and initially, in the community post, I suggested maybe doing a video on what are, in my opinion, the top 5 most disappointing games I've ever played, and I do like that topic, but I've generally reserved countdowns and stuff like that for actually written pieces on my Patreon, which I'll go ahead and plug right now. Also, thank you very much to my £10 patrons, Mr. Michael Craig, Mr. Andy Angel, and Mr. Captain L. Yeah, so I'm actually going to be doing the top five most disappointing games as a list on my Patreon. You can get access to that by signing up at the lower level for £6 a month. Not trying to sell you too hard, but £6 a month is £1.50 a week. The higher level that gets me reading out your beautiful names at the end of my longer videos is £10 a month, which is £2.50 a week, if you look at it that way. There's only two of them up at the moment because they're very big and long and comprehensive, like serious like article style stuff, and they take a lot of time and effort but uh, I will be working on the top five most disappointing games pretty much ASAP. It should be up very soon after this video goes up um, and you know I'm a writing student. I would say that the Patreon articles are some of the best and funniest things I've ever written. They're a lot like the videos that I make in script form. I'm really proud of them. I think they're very good. I think they're very enjoyable. Maybe I'm biased um, but yeah I'm gonna be writing that up as a list on my Patreon and I've decided what I'm gonna do to celebrate 10,000 subscribers. In my uh, games I played in 2019 video at the end of last year, I briefly referenced how there are four games that I've ever played that I would rate a 10 out of 10. I've decided that for every major milestone before 100,000, at which I'm going to do a video of my top 10 favourite games of all time, at every major milestone leading up to that, so 10,000, 25,000, 50,000 and 75,000, I'm going to talk about one of those four games that I've rated a 10 out of 10. Which means that not next video, because that's going to be back onto my main series, but the video after that, at the end of next month is going to be a video where I'm going to talk at length about one of those four mystery games that I've given a 10 out of 10. I will not be revealing what it is until the video comes out. Um, it won't exactly be an analysis, it will more be however many minutes of me just gushing about the game, but I think it should be fun, right? Anyway, thank you to people who have stuck by me so far, who are going to stick around for the future, especially hugely to those people who are going to go support me on Patreon, because that's a really huge deal. It's so gratifying to finally see this channel taking off and as I've said before, I'm a very ambitious guy, I, I want to do a lot of things, I'm just getting started here, you know, eventually down the line, I want like a set and a green screen, maybe an editor or something and a, and a camera guy, I want to I wanna be on camera a lot more and doing a lot more of this stuff live action, right, like live action game analysis with a dog and a chef's hat and a, a bunch of props, anyone? Sounds great to me. I don't want to be a disembodied voice talking over game footage forever, you know, like the intention of this channel above all else was to make people smile and laugh, I'm really hoping as time goes on, and as the channel grows, uh, I get the opportunity to explore those things more. So yeah, thank you to everyone again. Here's to the future. I'll see you again soon.